So here is a, a, a problem that shows that how little we know about modular representations. <laughs> <laughs> of course, in this audience, probably I don't need to explain that, but so suppose G is a, a finite group. And um, let's say uh, 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 B is an indecomposable representation uh, uh, over some field K, uh, let's say algebraically closed, characteristic B bigger than zero. Uh, and of course, the interesting case is when the order of the group is divisible by P. So this is going to be finite dimensional. Uh, and uh, well, let me uh, assume that dimension B is not equal to zero in K. So it's not zero mod P. So in this case, I can look at the tensor power. Uh, can decompose it in the indecomposables. Well, let me call it DL tilde of you because I want to do something slightly different, which I'm going to call DL. So one question that you might ask, how does this sequence behave? Well, there will be a lot, we say we have a P group, uh, there would be a lot of summons which will just be the free module over the group algebra. So most of this will be accounted for by that. So we should throw them out and see what happens if we throw them out, how the sequence of, uh, will behave then. And then it's a kind of total mystery, uh, but uh, we can uh, restrict ourselves to representations which have dimension uh, not zero mod k. Uh, so-called non-negligible representations. Because representations which have dimension zero mod k have the property that they form tensor ideal. So if you tensor any representation with an indecomposable dimension zero mod k, uh, in k, then uh, all the summons that you will get will have also dimension zero mod k, in k. Uh, uh, so let me... Uh, Write it like this. <coughs> Summons of dimension zero, and those are going to contain projectives and some others. Uh, and so, uh, what can we say about this sequence? Well, one thing. Uh, is that if you take dm of v as dm of v, uh, then this is uh, less than or equal to uh, d n plus m. Uh, well, this is obvious because uh, well, if you take v to the n and v to the m and decompose them into pieces and pick in each factor uh, in each of them a piece. Uh, which has dimension not divisible by p, then their tensor product has dimension not divisible by p. So in the decomposition, there will be at least one sum of dimension not divisible by p. And another obvious thing is that dn of v is, of course, did less than or equal than dimension over k in v to the n. No, so when I write dim v, I will mean an element of k, and when I write dimension over k v, I mean the integer. Uh, and so when you have such a sequence, then uh, there is a statement which uh, Dave uh, taught me is called fake the lemma in elementary analysis that says that uh, uh, if uh, dn is a sequence uh, uh, growing at most exponentially, Uh, satisfying this inequality, so 
the sequence of positive numbers, then uh, there exists uh, a limit on n goes to infinity, root of degree n, of the n, uh, which is uh, like the call t, which is a positive number. It's not difficult to show. Uh, and, and so we can so we can define this invariant, uh, which is in, introduced, for example, in the paper of Benson and Simons, uh, D of B, which is this. And uh, so the question is, what can we say about this number? So that's a positive real number. And uh, you know, you know, from elementary considerations, it is not easy to say much more than that. It's a real number big, bigger than one, uh, bigger or equal to one, uh, less than or equal uh, to uh, uh, dimension of v. Well, you can say a few more things, but not much more than that. But uh, what the theory of tensor category allows you is to prove much more about this number. Uh, and this is how I uh, got Dave to think about tensor categories, basically. So he asked me, what will it buy us, the people who worry about finite proofs and things like that? And uh, it turns out that you can, using that theory, prove some surprising results. So, uh, so here is a theorem. So this particular theorem was proved by Kulin uh, myself, and Ostig last year, uh, which says that this is not just an any, any real number, but this is actually an algebraic integer of a very specific kind. So d of v is uh, sum from i equals 1 to the floor function of p over 2 of n i times i q deform, where q is exponential of phi i over p, and uh, j q is q to the j minus q to the minus j divided by q minus q. So it's a q deformed number. Uh, and uh, mj are in z but bigger or equal to zero. Uh, and uh, for example, for p equal 2 and 3, this will prove, uh, this will imply that uh, uh, d of v is in z. And uh, for p equal 5, this uh, will say that d of v is in z plus z. Uh, that's 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. So this is the golden range. And in fact, you can uh, you can see that uh, uh, these uh, irrational numbers occur from a very simple example. So if you take in characteristic five, uh, so let's say p equals five, and then we take uh, g equals to z mod five, and v uh, is the three-dimensional indecomposable. Uh, um, so the generator goes to this matrix. Uh, so in this case, uh, uh, so uh, so this is the three by three Jordan block, and so if you tensor it with itself, you get the usual decomposition rule for Jordan blocks. In this case, it is the same in characteristic 5 or in characteristic 0. But then if you start tensoring further, well, this J5 is a projective. And if you tensor it with anything, you will just get multiples of J5. So, uh, so really, uh, you should forget about this. 
And then uh, you get this uh, tensoring rule, uh, which means that uh, if you uh, 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 jt to the n is going to be equal to a n times j b plus b n times j1, or j1 plus bn times j3 plus cn times j5. And this will be some huge number growing like 3 to the n, but these numbers will be Fibonacci numbers. The n, the n minus 1 Fibonacci number. So they will behave like 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 to the n. And this is much bigger. This behaves like 3 to the n. And, uh, and so in this case, dn, and so this will imply that d of v in this case is equal to 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. But what the theorem says that in characteristic 5, you cannot get anything else. As an in, than an integer plus an integer times 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. So, uh, and another interesting fact is the following, that, uh, okay, so you have uh, this uh, map from V to V of V, uh, and then uh, you, uh, so you, uh, and, and let's say uh, V goes to 0 if dimension of V equals to 0, 1, p. So this is for indecomposable representations. And so this defines you a character of the green ring, or split broton green. It gives us a linear map. Because these things, uh, so it's given, given on a basis. Uh, and uh, and uh, the theorem is that this is actually a homomorphism of rings. So D is a ring homomorphism. So I mentioned that representations of dimension 0 mod P form a tensor ideal. In particular, they will define an ideal in this ring. This ideal is killed by this homomorphism. So this is a homomorphism from the quotient. But the fact that it's a ring homomorphism really is that d of v tensor w equals to d of v times d of w. And that's, it, that's actually it's a strong statement, which is not obvious at all from elementary considerations. OK, so uh, and there are a few other corollaries, which I may mention if I have time, uh, of uh, elementary nature about groups. And in fact, uh, maybe a uh, theorem is that... That's the corollary of the theorem? No, it's not a corollary of this theorem. This theorem is a corollary of... Uh, both theorems are corollaries of some more general theorem that I didn't state. But the, and another thing is that this all holds for any affine groups. Not necessarily finite. For any affine group scheme over K, this holds. Uh, so now I will explain uh, how tensor categories can be used to prove such a statement. Before that, are there any questions? So you're claiming that D is additive as well, right? Yeah. Well, the DT was defined to be it. Oh, right. I defined it on the basis. Okay, you only define the right. right. But it's also true that this way, if I, if I allow representations which aren't indecomposable and make the same definition and define D in the same way, then it will coincide with what I define. But that's, uh, that's not difficult to see. Okay. Are, are both these theorems due to uh, Columbia, U, and Ostrich? Yes. Well, they were proved in our way. But we knew before this paper was written that they would follow from some theorem about tensor categories, which we couldn't was a conjecture at that time. And then we proved it last year. Other questions? Okay, so let me now explain how we can use uh, much more 
abstract technology to uh, handle this. So, uh, so first of all, I need to talk about symmetric tensor categories. Uh, and uh, let me say what I'm going to mean by this. Well, I mean, these are symmetric monoidal categories over K, but, but I also want them to be abelian, so let me precisely say what I'm going to mean. Sorry, Prof, so let me just get the situation right. So you're counting the occurrences of V in the decomposition of V tensor N, or you're counting the occurrences of... No, occurrences of... Uh, so I, I decompose and I count summons which have non-zero dimension. Okay. E might not occur at all. So it's over here in this example, you're counting J1 and J3? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to count both of them, but the, both of these sequences are. This is a Fibonacci. The sum of them is also going to be a Fibonacci number. So, so actually, D N. Uh, so D N is going to be a Fibonacci number. Uh, so if, uh, starts with one, then the next one is two, the next one will be three, five, eight, and so on. Other questions? Okay, so what do I mean by symmetric tensor category? So it's going to be a K linear category and a billion. <clears throat> then it's going to be uh, Artinian, which means that uh, uh, objects have finite length and finite dimensional form spaces. Uh, then uh, it's going to be one more. Uh, then it's going to be rigid, which means it has duality with appropriate axioms. Then it's uh, going to be symmetric. So there is a fermentation model which squares to the identity and satisfies the hexagon relations. And then, uh, well, we have additive axioms and multiplicative axioms, and then there should be compatibility, the distributivity axiom, which says the tensor product is bilinear on morphisms. And finally, uh, I want the morphisms of the unit to be equal to K. So this is what I'm going to mean by a tensor category. Symmetric tensor category. And an example of such a category is uh, uh, representations. You do not require enough projectors. No, and I, I don't. I, I think it's in the infinite groups or group schemes. Like, I wanted to include, the, for example, this example with an affine group scheme. So, a representation of G where G is an affine group scheme. So, so the I can't really read. So the um, you require a generator or, or what? Hmm? Do you you're, are you requiring a generator? I mean, this affineness is like having a generator, a tensor generator. Uh, no, uh, if it's a finite type group, then we'll have. Uh, so if you have a particular, if the category is finitely tensor generator, so uh, if you take representations on a affine group scheme, then. Uh, uh, we, we can consider schemes of finite type, and this is equivalent to uh, the category being finitely tensor generated. Yeah so, yeah, so are you assuming that as a condition? Or? No. Okay. no, I don't need to. It's series local, basically, so you can work with what is generated by given. Okay, and so. Uh, and in particular, the, the tensor is automatically exact right, because of rigidity. Yes, absolutely. It's automatically exact. Uh, and uh, uh, another type of examples is, uh, well, so for example, if G is trivial, the, the simplest example is the category of vector spaces over K. And then we have an example uh, when characteristic of K is different from 2. Uh, and this is over arbitrary algebraically closed field, including characteristic 0. But if characteristic of K is not equal to 2, then we have the category of super vector spaces over K, which differs from uh, the usual category of, uh, let's say, representations of a group Z mod 2, or Z mod 2 graded vector spaces, 
by uh, saying that uh, this permutation map, the symmetric braiding, is going to be given by uh, C V tensor W equals to minus 1 to the degree of V, degree of W, W tensor V. So, uh, uh, so we have a Z mod 2 graded space with these degrees and then switch uh, between two odd vectors is going to be minus the usual switch. And, uh, and because of that we can uh, define the, if you have a super group, so we can consider super groups, so G is an affine super group scheme. Well, which is really a fine group scheme in this category. So this means uh, what is a fine group scheme is the same thing as a commutative Hopf algebra. So this is going to be a commutative Hopf algebra in uh, so functions on G in uh, super vector spaces on K. So if you write it in classical terms, so this category uh, cannot refactor forgetting the grading is not symmetric monoidal. It's only monoidal. So but the symmetry is uh, changed. And because of that, if you write it down using that functor, you will get a Hopf algebra. You will, you will get what is called a super commutative Hopf super algebra. So it will not be a Hopf algebra, and it will not be commutative, only super commutative. But you can write down exactly what they have axioms are. Uh, and so if you have such a thing, uh, then you can consider representations of G on super vector spaces. And that turns out to be not the most general thing. There is a slightly more general thing you can do, which is the following, that you can fix more generally can fix um, uh, an element Z in uh, G of K. So that's an ordinary group because we're taking points over the whole classical ring, uh, points over the field, which squares to the identity, and such that uh, z acts on functions on g by parity. So such an element acts by conjugation on g, and then it acts on functions on g, and that action should be by the parity. So, uh, so if you fix such an element. Uh, if you don't have such an element, then you uh, you can well, then you will have to you always have t uh, so uh, uh, if uh, uh, if you don't have such an element, you can adjoin this element to your group, and then you can take uh, representations G C, which is representations of G where z acts by parity. And so if, uh, if g is an ordinary super, so, so this is a special case, uh, namely your uh, representations of g is the representations of z centered for the g z. Uh, and so, uh, so this is, uh, and this is more or less, uh, in characteristic zero, the most general thing you can do. Well, uh, more precisely, uh, it's the most general thing you can do if you don't want to get some categories which are wildly big. Somehow. So here is a, a, a definition which is due to the uh, a symmetric tensor category. Has moderate growth if for every object V in C uh, there exists a constant C sub V such that uh, uh, length <coughs> of tensor power is less than or equal uh, than uh, this constant to the n. Uh, and uh, so, the, in other words, uh, lengths uh, with no finite lengths, but lengths of the tensor power should not grow too fast, should not grow faster than exponential. 
And it turns out that there exist categories for which this is not satisfied. They were already mentioned in the famous text of the Linian Mill, uh, which is called Tanakian categories. And they are obtained by interpolating representation category of general linear groups over complex numbers to sizes of matrices which are not integers. So one can do that, and then uh, uh, for those categories, we will still have sure wild duality, uh, namely v to the n will decompose according to representations of symmetric group. But uh, uh, the difference will be that all representations of, regardless of n, all representations of symmetric group will occur, not just those who, which have a, a bounded number of rows. And because of that, the length of v to the n is going to grow like n factorial, because uh, the sum of dimensions of representations of symmetric group grows roughly like maybe square root of n factorial. And it's faster than any exponential. And uh, however, if you prohibit, if, if you require this moderate growth, then uh, in characteristic zero, it turns out that you don't get anything else. And that's the famous theorem of Levine. So here is the theorem. Levine, 2002. Uh, a symmetric tensor category over field of characteristic zero. It doesn't matter which one you use, of course. Uh, of moderate growth. Uh, if and only if uh, C is ref G Z or some supergroup and, uh, and some element C. And uh, this, well, and then you can show that it's so in a unique way. Namely, this pi R G Z is de determined uniquely up to inner automorphisms. Uh, okay, but in characteristic P, uh, this is false. Uh, and, uh, the simplest example of this, again, is provided by uh, uh, in characteristic 5, but to explain this example, I need to explain the concept of semi-simplification. Of the symmetric tensor category. And to explain this notion, I first need to explain what the trace of an endomorphism. So suppose you have an object X in the symmetric tensor category, and suppose you have a morphism A from X to X. Then, then I can define the trace of it. How to do that? Well, it starts with the unit object. Then uh, uh, object X is rigid. There is a dual object, X dual, and that comes with a, a map from 1 to X tensor X dual, which is called the co-evaluation map. And then I can uh, apply my A in the first component, and I get X tensor X dual. And then I can switch. I go to X dual tensor X. And then I, there is also, this also comes with an evaluation map, which uh, uh, contracts this thing. And we go back to one. So the composition is a morphism from one to one. But remember that we have this axiom that endomorphism of 1 is k. So this is a number in k. And that's denoted by trace of a. And you can check that if x is a vector space, if you work with ordinary representations, this is going to be the usual trace. While if you're working with super vector spaces, this is going to be the super trace, which is the trace on the even part minus the trace on the odd part. OK, and so. Uh, and then uh, there is also a notion of dimension of X, which is the trace of the identity map from X to itself. And that's an element of K. And again, for usual representations, it's the usual dimension regarded as an element of K. And for super representations, that's a super dimension, which is dimension of the even part minus dimension of the odd part regarded as an element of K. And then uh, 
one can do the following thing, so make the following definition, which really, uh, in some form, goes back to Grothendieck, where when he considered the uh, trying to build the theory of motives in the 1960s. So it says that a morphism A from X to X is negligible if there exists, uh, if, if for every morphism B, uh, x to y is negligible if the, for any morphism the other way trace of the composition is zero and uh, note that this is uh, the same as to say uh, trace of a b always equals to trace of b a it's easy to show and so it doesn't matter whether you write a b or b a here uh, and uh, lemma which is why it's a useful notion, is that negligible morphisms for the tensor idea. Uh, this means that uh, it's a, so this means that we have a subspace N of x, y inside home from x to y for every two objects x and y. And uh, this, subs this collection of subspaces in this invariant under composition with other morphisms and also tensor product with other morphisms. And whenever you have a tensor ideal, you can form a quotient category. So we can, uh, we can define a symmetric monoidal category. C mod n, which I'm going to call C bar, uh, it is defined by the uh, property that objects are the same. A form in C bar from x to y is a uh, form in C from x to y, modular the negligible x y. <coughs> so. Uh, well, a priori, it is not clear that this is an abelian category, but it turns out that it is, and moreover, it is semi-simple. And that's why this procedure is called semi-simplification. And this is based on a lemma which can be found uh, in Dave's paper from 40 years ago. Uh, I don't know if it was known to Grotten, most likely, uh, maybe it was, but, uh, but uh, the lemma is the following, that uh, it characterizes what it means for a morphism to be negligible. But in fact, it is easier to say what it means for a morphism not to be negligible. So uh, if x, so there are two parts. First of all, if x and y are indecomposable, then uh, a morphism A from X to Y is not negligible if and only if A is an isomorphism and dimension of X is not zero. And the second fact is uh, tells you in general what it means to be uh, uh, negligible. So. Uh, if you have uh, x, maybe it's too long here. So, uh, okay, I'm okay, here. here. So, if x is a direct sum of x i, which are indecomposable, and y is a direct sum of y j, and a from x to y. Uh, a is uh, given by the matrix A i j from x i to y j, then A is negligible if and only if for all i and j, A i j are negligible. So it gives us a criterion how to check that some morphism is negligible in a rather simple way. We're going to test my skills how to erase the board. So let us see if I can do it.
So you have this case algebraically closed, right? Hmm? Case algebraically closed, right? Yes, yes. You can do things with non closed, but we don't understand what's happened for algebraically closed. What happens for algebraically closed? So I decided for simplification. Is it important for this lemma or not? Mm. Yeah. No, for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Yes. Um, uh, um, modules with zero dimension that are not negligible. Uh, not ah, yeah, 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 that's right. Okay, yeah, because you may have division algebras exactly. of rank divisible by P. So probably it's true if you take absolutely decomposable or something like this. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I will not check if I did it right and will I actually be able to write on this one. Okay, so uh, so and uh, so what happens really is that if you look at endomorphism algebra of an object X, which is indecomposable, uh, then, uh, so let, let me explain why uh, dimension zero, non-zero effect mm -hmm. appears here. Well, this is a local ring, uh, and it can be written as K plus M, where this is the maximal ideal. Uh, and this maximal ideal is also the nil radical. So in particular, all elements in this maximal ideal are nilpotent. And uh, if you have a nilpotent element, its trace is going to be zero, because you have a filtration uh, of x by uh, images of powers of this uh, element. And if you write with respect to this decomposition, then you basically get a strictly upper triangular matrix. So to speak. And, and you get zero trace. So all of these definitely are going to be negligible, but this one, it depends on the dimension. So the identity morphism will be negligible if, uh, and only if the dimension is zero, because trace of the identity is the dimension. So what this procedure does, it forces Schur's lemma on this category by making indecomposables uh, uh, into irreducibles, and if uh, they are uh, not isomorphic, <coughs> then the bond between them is going to be zero, because everything is negligible. And if they are isomorphic, then home will be one-dimensional if the dimension is not zero. So it forces sure lemma, and also it kills all objects that have dimension zero. So we get that uh, so we get that C bar is a semi-simple category. And uh, it's simple objects so sy symmetric tensor category and its simple objects are indecomposables of C of dimensions U. So it's going to have lots and lots of uh, uh, simple objects in general but because there are lots and lots of indecomposable if you group with wild representation type. Not, 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 not. Yes. Uh, but it's going to be semi-simple, so that's a trade-off. Even if you started with a p-group, the only simple object was the trivial representation. We had lots of indecomposables. Now we don't have any. So decomposables are the same as the reducibles, but we get lots and lots of indecomposables. So, and in particular, you can compute what happens. So the counter example to this theorem is obtained when you already take the simplest example. Yes. Is it obvious that it's a billion? Uh, it's semi-simple. So semi-simple. Uh, oh, semi-simple. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah, 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 a billion. Okay. It's semi-simple. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, and so, uh, so now I... Uh, I can explain how to get a counterexample to this theorem in positive characteristic. This appears out of the simplest example you can imagine when you take the group G equals to Z mod phi. 
P. Uh, and in this case, uh, what do we have? So in decomposables are going to be Jordan blocks J1 up to JP of sizes 1 through P. Uh, and, and then uh, simple objects of C bar are going to be, so this is the union. And uh, there is going to be, I will call them L1 up to LP minus 1, but the LP, which comes from JP, is going to be uh, Q. And then the, you can look at the tensor product rule. Uh, so this is going to be truncated the yes. Gordon rule. Uh, namely, if you tensor L M with L N, it's going to be the direct sum from I equals to one uh, uh, to uh, minimum of M N P minus N P minus N of L M minus N plus two I minus one. So if we don't have p minus n and p minus n, this would be the usual Klebsch Gordon rule for tensoring representations of SL2 over complex numbers. But because of p, we get some truncation, and that's what you get. And that's for, that rule appeared, uh, so this is called the Berlinder rule, because it appeared in the work of physicist Eric Berlinde in 1988 when he studied conformal field theory. This is, in fact, the fusion product for representations of affine the algebra SL2 hat uh, for uh, level uh, uh, p minus two, it also appeared in the work of Sandy Green from the nineteen sixties. So. Yeah, so it, <laughs> that's right. So this is not a, a good name, but uh, you know, this uh, definitely this is not uh, this is an older uh, construction. It's you can tensor things and then throw away things that are dimension divisible by p. So, uh, because of this, uh, this group category was called var p. Uh, so, Verlinde category. And not only Verlinde was not the first person who wrote down this formula, but also he did not uh, think about categories. I don't know if he even knew the definition of a category. <laughs> the category was introduced. Uh, the category in the, it, what, exactly this category was introduced in a slightly different way in the work of uh, Sergei Gelfand and, and uh, Kashdan and also uh, Georgi and Mathieu uh, around 1992. And uh, in fact, they introduced it in a slightly different way. Namely, uh, they considered uh, instead of category of representations of Z mod P, they consider representation category of the tilt, or they consider category of tilting modules for the uh, algebraic group SL2K. Tilting modules don't form an abelian category, but in fact, for this construction, you don't need to have an abelian category. All you need is the trace of an important endomorphism is equal to zero. And that's satisfied. If your category is a subcategory of an abelian category, that's good enough. And, uh, and another thing you could do, instead of Z mod P, you could take uh, uh, alpha P, uh, uh, which is uh, G, uh, GA1, the Frobenius kernel of GA. Uh, and uh, you will get the same result. The categories are initially different, but the same simplification turns out to be the same. And in particular, you can compute the tensor product rule here. So in bar 5, we can do the same computation I already did uh, for you. So uh, if we take L3 tensor with L3, this is equal to 1 plus L3 plus L5 die. And uh, so this means that this cannot be possibly realized in vector spaces uh, of any kind. So, uh, so this dimension. Uh, so, so, so there cannot be a realization of this by uh, 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 by vector spaces or super vector spaces because the dimension of this space. So you get a functor from your category to 
vector spaces over k. Not even monoidal, just a functor that respects uh, the tensor product at the level of object. Uh, then the uh, dimension of f of L3 would have to be written 1 plus rate of 5 over 2, which is nonsense, of course, because it has to be an integer. Uh, so there, there is no such one. And so this shows that this, uh, because uh, the Lean theorem can be formulated, can be formulated as, as saying that uh, such a category, C, a symmetric tensor category over C of moderate growth, if and only if there exists a symmetric monoidal exact functor from C to super vector spaces over K. And in this case, this G can be recovered as the scheme of automorphisms of this yeah. And so th this shows that such a functor cannot uh, exist. So the theorem is false in this case. But, uh, okay, so of course uh, it's a better negative news that it is false. But um, it's a start of a very nice story which says, so what should replace the means here? Obviously, we cannot keep the super vector spaces here. But let's remember what happened in the usual case, in characteristic zero. So we worked with group representations, and we wondered if all categories have a functor to vector space. And then all of a sudden, we discovered the example of super vector spaces, which doesn't fit that pattern. And then we said, OK, it doesn't fit that pattern, but let's put it to the right, put it as a target category. And then it turns out that all reasonable categories that we want to study are covered by that. Well, in characteristic P, it happens the story is more complicated as it usually happened. So what should we do? Well, we should put this category as a target category, because it turns out that it cannot be mapped to a smaller one. And uh, the question asked by Ostry, if C is a symmetric tensor category of moderate growth, yeah, I'll be finishing soon, uh, over K of characteristic P, does it imply, uh, because one implication here is trivial, and the other implication is D that there exists a function with D. Uh, does it imply that there exists an F which maps the C into verb P? Note that when P is bigger than 2, then verb P contains uh, objects L1 and LP minus 1, which together form uh, the category of super vector spaces or K. So this is more general. It's a product. So verb P is a product of where p plus with super vect over k, where this is the category spent by Li with odd i. In characteristic 2, of course, there is nothing new because there is no super vector space. Uh, there is no sign. So he asked this question. Well, that turned out to be false, but he proved this for semi simple categories with finitely many objects. And the, the theorem that we proved of this Coulombier uh, <coughs> of finite number of simple <laughs> is that if C is semi simple, then uh, then F exists. And you know these situations, by the way, when F exists, it is unique after an isomorphism. Uh, for non semi simple categories, the story is more complicated. There exist categories where Linda P to the, some power, which was studied in my paper with Dave and with Ostrich, and you have to include them. But I won't talk about that. We don't understand the story there fully yet. But in the semi-simple case, this is the result. And more generally, we can characterize exactly such categories. Categories C with F from C to verb P of moderate growth uh, are exactly uh, 
uh, what we call Frobenius exact categories. So namely we have for every object x we have the divided power of x and we have the symmetric power of x. And there is always a canonical map. So these are Coinvariants of symmetric group in the tensor power. These are invariants. There is always a canonical map. Uh, and the uh, image, uh, so Frobenius of X is the image of this uh, phi. Uh, and that should be an exact function in X. In general, this function isn't, isn't left or right exact. But in, uh, if you're, but it commutes with monoidal functors. So if your category has a uh, monoidal functor into a semi-simple category, which is exact, then, uh, uh, then this functor will be exact. Because you can compute it after application of your functor. And it turns out that uh, that is exactly the Frobenius exact category. They are exactly categories of representations of affine group schemes in this Berlin that people. And finally, I can explain how this can be used to prove the theorem that I stated before. Can I just what what provinces should if if have again? Can you just repeat that? If, if from C to verb P, is it what what provinces should that functor have? So such uh, so exact symmetric monoidal. Hmm. Exact symmetric monoidal functor, which is called the fiber functor. Yeah. So it's like fiber functor of the theory of Tanaki and Kate. Exactness for free? Mm. Uh, exactness for free, or it wasn't for free? Exactness. Exactness, no. Uh, uh, so it, uh, no, it's not for free. I mean, if you, for example, the functor from uh, uh, there is always a functor from a, from a tensor category to its semi simplification, and such functors aren't allowed. Ah, that's what you cannot use. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this was what so I was. Semi simplified uh, uh, that's right. Yes. <laughs> this was exactly. That's what's yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's not enough. That you were too much. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so let me explain. For, this is the last thing I will say. How you uh, can apply this uh, to uh, to prove this theorem, and this I can do on this space. <laughs> so. Uh, so you have some group G, okay? You have some representation <coughs> B. Uh, yeah, so you have some group G, then you have representation K of G. Okay? Uh, call that C. Uh, then we can uh, attach to it the category C bar, which is the semi simplification. Objects are the same, but to distinguish the objects of C from objects of C bar, I'm going to call the object corresponding to X by X bar. Then, uh, if I raise X to the N, uh, it decomposes into decomposables uh, plus negligibles. Now, I, the objects of dimension zero uh, are exactly the negligible objects, so those are killed in the same simplification. So I have this thing, and this implies uh, that uh, x bar to the n is the direct sum of wi bar, because those get killed. And, uh, and so this implies that this dn of e, dn of x, is the length simply of x to the n. X bar to the n. Now, but we have this functor here. And, well, what we can compute easily is the length of f of x bar to the n. Because that is just a computation in this category where p. So we just need to uh, work with this formula here. The Klebsch Gordon formula. And, uh, well, I mean, there is a character, so, so this uh, ring, which I could call RP. So if you tensor that with C, this is a direct sum of copies of C. 
i equals 1 to p minus 1 of c corresponding to characters. And in particular, there is a positive character, which is called the Frobenius Perron dimension. This is the first coordinate of the sum. And uh, of L uh, i, this is going to be q to the i minus q to the minus i over q minus q inverse, where q is e to the pi i over p. And so uh, this is easy to compute. So this is going to behave as uh, this Frobenius Perron dimension of f of x bar to the n. So it's going to lambda to the n, where lambda is going to be a sum of this m i times i q. And so the only thing is this is not exactly the same as this, because when you apply a functor, the length can increase. However, one can show, and it's not very hard, that the length doesn't increase too much. It increases by a factor that is sub-exponential. And for that reason, if you take your nth root, that doesn't make any difference. And the limit of the root n of this is the same as the limit of root n of this. And so that means that this d of x is really the frobenius Perron dimension of f of x bar. And uh, so this shows that it's a ring of homomorphism, because uh, this is a ring homomorphism, and f is a monoidal functor. And semi-simplification is also a monoidal functor. And this gives all these corollaries. So I think I should stop. There, is a, uh, there are other things that you can prove. For example, maybe you just mention one. <laughs> you also have a little corner there. <laughs> <laughs> so if you tensor uh, in a representation tensor to the n, and you compute its length, uh, well, uh, d, uh, so if you compute this dn of p, so we see that this is d of p to the n, but the question is, what is the next term of asymptotics? So let's say it's constant d of p to the n, and if you do it in characteristic zero, there will be an n to some power. In the, in the denominator. For example, if V is the standard representation of SL2, then it's going to be like 2 to the n divided by square root of n. Well, it turns out that in characteristic P, this doesn't happen. So in characteristic P, the result says that uh, <laughs> maybe it's good that just I have no space to write. It's, it says that it's always bounded below. Uh, in characteristic P, the ratio of dn of v by d of v to the n is separated away from zero by a constant that you can actually estimate. It's actually it, it, interesting that that constant is independent on the group. It only depends on the, on the dimension of v. And it is uh, uh, like, behaves like basically e to the minus constant times d squared, where d is the dimension of v. Uh, well, it's a bad bound, so for characteristic 2 and 3, and now 5, we can show that the, co the correct bound is actually e to the minus constant times d. But to prove that, for higher p, we need to know more about tensor categories, which we don't currently. But the, the, the reason for, uh, I can explain you the reason why characteristic p is nicer here. Because in characteristic 0, there are reductive groups, which are non-abelian. But in characteristic p, the correct notion is linearly reductive groups. And the Nagata theorem tells you that a connected linearly reductive group is abelian. So that's, uh, that's basically why. Abelian group has representations which uh, are one-dimensional. So length gets bigger. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>